Hi, good afternoon. Come on now, good afternoon. Let's go. Both barrels are loaded. This is just a warning. Before I even get into the message, which is 2 Peter, if you'd like to turn there, I have a little bit of business that wasn't intended, but I thought, first of all, I saw this in the um, brochure for the conference. This is great. This little underneath the welcome page, there's one sentence I just would like to reiterate. It would be easy to be discouraged and become weary, but we do believe this is the home stretch on planet Earth, so look up. That's right in here, in your program. The other thing is, um, well, I'll get to this a little bit. Pronoun tips. Do you guys need these? You laugh, and I go, yeah, pronoun tips. We all know what this is about. But do we? Do we know how demonic this is? They're trying to punish people for using the wrong language. And who, who, who decided that this language was necessary anyway? So these are, at, these are in grade school hallways and bulletin boards. And just a couple things, pronoun tips, um, and this is not part of the message today. Using someone's correct pronouns is a, is a sign of basic respect and shows that you see them for who they truly are. Lie. Public schools in America. Next, uh, people may change their pronouns over time. Fluid. You can be one thing one day, one thing the next day. And then here's one more. I mean, there's a whole list here, but I'm just going to give you one more. Never assume someone's pronoun or gender. So now there's etiquette that we have to live by. Who wrote these rules for society? So before I get started, uh, one more thing, and that is a quote I shared a while back. I may have shared this last year, but if your church... I know, one of the questions we get, how do you find a good church now that teaches the whole counsel of God, that includes the Old Testament, that is discerning the times, that talks about Bible prophecy? And That's really hard. <laughs> you just named four things. But there's a topic now we have to address. When the world is screaming about things like sexuality and gender, but the church remains silent, then a whole generation only hears one worldview. The church must be loving, but it can't be silent. When the Bible speaks on things, we must teach the next generation what it says. And it covers all of these issues, doesn't it? Doesn't the word of God? So turn to Peter, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. No, wait a minute, chapter 2. So we're going to be looking at biblical examples of God's judgment, as well as some men who lived during times of great wickedness. Hello, welcome. You can all say, yeah, that's us. Um, yeah, in America, we can certainly relate to that now. Um, we're living at a time of rampant ungodliness, a time in which evil is being called good, good, evil, Isaiah 5.20. Um, not only that, they're now demanding, we not only approve of what the Bible considers to be sin, but now you better celebrate it. Hmm. Usually we, we used to be able to just believe what we wanted to believe, but now it's not, not acceptable. So in America, we find ourselves living in a country that we barely recognize, especially if you're over 40. Um, Do we just ignore it? Do we avoid it? How do we handle this? It can be very overwhelming. That's why I read that uh, from the brochure here, uh, that it's easy to be discouraged, but this is the home stretch. Look up, because this is really heavy, what's going on. It always reminds me of Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So that means we have to do something. We have to say something. You can't overcome by sitting and, you know, whatever. Let's move on. Uh, the Bible makes it clear God judges evil. The question we're going to answer today, or actually you, only you can answer this. Have you experienced a sense of oppression, being in this culture, under, seeing what's going on, and as a Christian, knowing the word of God, and having the Holy Spirit. Do you experience that? Am I the only one? Right? We're in good company. It is a sense of oppression. Well, according to the Bible, men of God 
could relate. So we're going to talk about one today. Um, the Christian church has not always responded well. One quick example, Corinth. So they had issues with uh, sinful behavior, sexual immorad- immorality, according to Paul. But if you look at Revelation 2, verse 2, Revelation 2, 2, I know your deeds. Now Jesus, of course, speaking through John. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance. And, get this, that you cannot tolerate evil men. I personally would have loved a whole other paragraph on that to explain what they were doing, what this church was doing, that they were commended, that they didn't tolerate evil. Because we don't live in that society today. We don't live in that society anymore where people of God, moral or righteous people, do not tolerate evil. We're not there anymore. Why? We'll get to that. So we're told to be tolerant, but they've redefined tolerance now, haven't they? Judge ye not, lest ye be judged. One of the most ripped out of context passages in the the entire Bible just about. uh, What about the expression, um, live and let live. Just live and let live. Just live and let live. Let them live. You just live however you want to. The problem is you let them live however they want to. It's going to affect you and your speech is what we're finding out. So Peter gives three powerful examples of divine judgment in 2 Peter 2. Judgment on the wicked that set a precedent for future judgment. Now the holiness of God as we know demands that wickedness be judged. Peter mentions angels cast into hell. He mentions that God did not spare the ancient world of Noah's day. But let's look at the third example, the total destruction of two famously evil cities. Before we do that, I just pulled up an article because I was researching a little bit of archaeology on Sodom, the city of Sodom, true true history, right? And this is from, I mean, you can look at all kinds of sources, but this happens to be from from Forbes. (laughs) They're writing about this. And it wasn't God, had nothing to do with that. It was a meteor, a meteor. A massive meteor may have destroyed the biblical city of Sodom. That's the headline. This is from a couple years ago. So let me read just a couple lines of what it says. It quotes Genesis 19.28. So they're going, okay, we've heard about this before. I mean, they say something in the Bible about this. So they quoted it. And he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And behold, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Genesis 19, 28. Is it possible that this story has roots in historical reality? So whenever you hear them say story, just think, okay, cartoon. To them, it's a cartoon. To them, it's just made up. Um, So... Recent archaeological findings that have been published indicate a large meteor may have destroyed the ancient city of Tal el Hammam, and that this destruction, see that happened, right? Archaeological finds indicate this happened. And because of that, this may have gone on to form the basis of the biblical story of the destruction of Sodom. So they have evidence that there's, in that area, archaeologically, there is a meteor that came down and caused massive damage. Now, not what we know from the Bible, um, that whole area, not just Sodom and Gomorrah, but the plains around it were incinerated, right? So a meteor can do damage, but just basically to one confined area from what I understand. But anyway, we'll get to that. So to them, it may have destroyed that, and then, oh, Christians must have got this idea. Hey, let's put that in the Bible. That sounds good. Sounds like we can scare people with that. So to them, the Bible obviously is a myth or a fable made up. Um, So they're so wrong. But let's just go into this archaeology archaeology a little bit from this article. Now, you can look this up yourself about ruins and, and things that were found. Pottery and mud bricks were melted in what we know is the former city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Bones were found smashed and scattered, buried in layers of ash, charcoal, and pulverized mud bricks. Archaeologists dig through these things. They find a blackened layer where the rocks themselves kind of told a story of widespread flames. Wow, how did that happen? The bottom layer is made up of pulverized bricks, melted roof clay, charcoal, Above that is a wind-blown layer of small bits of plaster, charcoal, and limestone. 
Topping it off is a dark, almost black layer of ash. So that's what they know, archaeologists and scientists and you know, but we know from the Bible what actually happened and what caused it. So let's go to 2 Peter 2, starting in verse 6. It, we just know from the previous verse, obviously, that he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Um, verse 5, I mean, the ancient world, you know, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others. He, he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Verse 6, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Now in this true historical account, God made an example out of the cities and surrounding area, not just the cities, that's an important point. He gives a model, a pattern, a warning to future generations that places like you know, Time and Newsweek and People and Forbes and other, they, they, don't, they don't get it. They gotta find some other explanation. Wickedness results in judgment. To them it's gotta be a, just a, a meteor, a falling star or something, not God. Many people think the story of Sodom's complete destruction is made up, but as we know, these, these are real people living around uh, 1650 BC, and most Americans, this is interesting, I was thinking about that, we haven't heard this in a long time, the expression, um, the, you would hear sermons, fire and brimstone preaching. Do you remember that? Some of you maybe, maybe over 50. <laughs> you don't hear those sermons anymore, but you know what, I think we need them. I think we need those in America. In the United States of entertainment, we desperately need some fire and brimstone sermons to warn this generation. Um, also, the legal term sodomy, where did that come from? It describes unnatural sex acts. So Sodom and Gomorrah were two of five cities referred to in scripture from references to the plain of the Jordan, Genesis 13.10, the valley of Siddim, the Salt Sea, that's Genesis 14.3, and Abraham looking down to see the cities of the plain from the area of Hebron, that's Genesis 19.28, um, but this happened, what they found in 1973, hmm, all of a sudden, solid archeological evidence for locating the cities of the plain. Researchers have discovered archeological evidence of a catastrophic occurrence comparable to the one explained in the book of Genesis. Moreover, the Dead Sea Zone once was residence to a flourishing civilization. Now this is interesting too. Genesis 13.10 explains the area was like Egypt, like a garden, like it actually says in quotes, well watered everywhere. What is it now? So Jude 1 verse 7 says this, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Is this world learning from those examples? <laughs> How do righteous people react to sin and, re and rebellion against God? So I, wanna, I looked into this because it just j jumped out at me because of how I feel sometimes when I see our culture, especially what they're doing to young children and babies in the womb. And I could keep, go on and on and on. But, but I looked up this word, the Greek word for oppressed from 2 Peter 2 here implies Lot was deeply troubled. Tormented is another idea. Vexed, vexed. 
is another word you might use. The immoral, outrageous behavior of people living in and around Sodom and Gomorrah tormented him. So don't feel bad about being vexed, tormented to some degree about what's going on around us. It's natural for us. If we care, if we love our neighbors, we will feel kind of oppressed by what's, what we see happening. It is disturbing. It is demonic. So how does the Christian church today generally respond to immorality and rampant sin throughout society? I think we've forgotten how to blush, for one. We're not um, shocked or appalled. Um, and so that now we're going to take a little turn here in this session. And I prayed about this, and I thought, ah, if, I mean, kids are hearing about this, the church should be able to hear some of the words that I'm going to share with you in this story. It's a recent news story, and the subject matter uh, that follows demonstrates what happens when man tries to replace God and anything goes and this will be another example of 2 Timothy 3, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And this is, I've been writing for years, this is one of the most disturbing things that I've researched recently and ha written about. I wrote a recent article on that. I think I have it here. This is, it's on my website. I'll refer to it in a minute. But So the first part of the story is not so bad. We've got three different parts in this that we're going to go to different levels of depravity and, and delusion. Um, last year, at the University of Alabama, UAB, they became one of the first in the US to offer a uterus transplant procedure to hysterectomy patients, as well as very rare cases where a woman is born without a womb. Extremely rare. Well, now with modern science and technology and medical advancements, they have a way to try to help, all right? One mother was diagnosed with a rare condition that caused her to be born without a uterus, and they did a procedure at UAB. Fascinating, in May of this year, a baby boy was born, the first because of that program called the Uterus Transplant Program, one of four in the country that performs the new operation, and it is the first to do it outside of a clinical trial. Remarkable, right? But quite different from trying to make a man a woman and a woman a man, and you know where this is going. The first uterus transplant was done in Sweden in 2014. There have been about 100 of them worldwide. The process involves multiple surgeries and follow-up appointments on average a year and a half, 18 months it takes. The procedure is considered high risk, and here's where this takes the first unexpected turn, but if you've been paying attention, no surprise especially since COVID. Now, BC, before COVID, <laughs> we wouldn't have maybe been on to this, but now we look at the, those that are supposed to do no harm and say, well, wait a minute. So the American Medical Association, AMA, the Journal of Ethics, just recently, their authors are suggesting uterus transplants to help transgender women a.k.a. men, try to get pregnant. There's one thing to, to scientifically, medically help a woman who, through no fault of her own, was born without a womb. Help her maybe do that surgery, go through that year and a half and all that at high risk if she wants to try to have a baby. I understand that. But now we've got a whole new level. But this is the AMA, the American Medical Association. So... These procedures can cost up to $300,000. And now, the reason I wrote an article about it a few weeks ago is because they say taxpayers could help fund this. That's right. Taxpayers could help fund uterus transplants for men. That's not their headline, but that's, I'm just giving it to you the truth, right? So now we're debating these transplants so biological men can be affirmed and try to have babies. Be honest, with a show of hands, how many of you did not see this coming? Come on. Oh, you're all, you all just got a, got a crystal ball, right? Come on. You're a bunch of prophets. Okay. 
Well, responding to the news, there are some good guys out there. Dr. Martin Mackery, professor at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, stated, rather than funding objective medical studies on transgender medicine, the AMA has chosen activist positions on this delicate topic. Why don't they fund a study on the 10-year regret rate of children who undergo transition sur surgery? What is the suicide rate among those who undergo aggressive hormone or surgical treatment versus long-term talk therapy or you know, counseling? He also pointed out the irony that the AMA is promoting uterus transplants for men to maybe have a baby to, to, to allow life to be born, while other so-called treatments for transgender children are making minors permanently infertile. Isn't this twisted? Well, these ideas, this fantasy, this delusion didn't come up in the last 10 years. I, um, in my new book, I'm writing about this because I seem to go find stuff that goes back further and further. There's a 1953 film called Glenn or Glenda, 1953. I know, guys, I got this out of order. Thank you for putting that up on the screen. I didn't think it went back that far. I thought it was 1958, the first so-called transgender surgery, Christine Jorgensen, 56 or 58, but 53, they were actually thinking about this. Someone was doing it. Someone was fantasizing, right? So do you see what's happening here? Well, first of all, let's call it what it is. This is delusion. This is deception. This is demonic. We must not be afraid to use these words. Our culture won't like it. Some in some of our churches might not like us talking this straight and plainly about this. But if this doesn't come from the pit of hell and Satan himself, where does it come from? When you've got to remove God and his existence and his creation and his divine order, so, Satan hates God's image in mankind. That's what I talked about last in the spring in my session there. This is an attack on Imago Dei. Satan drives this train trying to destroy lives, manipulate mankind, kill, steal, and destroy. I was very fascinated by Curtis Bauer's point a uh, hundred years ago. They changed from the propaganda to Public relations, it's just PR. And Hollywood media, the one-party big tech media conglomerate and the public school system, they've done some PR over the years, haven't they? Propaganda. So the Darwinian lie that says mankind and the world is getting better and better, this leads to transhumanism. And to me, I'm looking at this as go, wow, this is just, it's another form of population control. But let's, let's talk about this. Now we see billions of dollars being poured into AI, artificial intelligence, this research. We're, we're now just catching up with some of this. In 1998, I didn't realize this, the World Transhumanist Association was founded in 98. So my friend and colleague, Dr. J.B. Hickson, uh, if you want to hear him, by the way, on Worldview Matters Monday, he's, he's my guest. He puts it this way, transhumanism is the Luciferian's attempt to merge man and machine into a synthetically created being that will transcend humanity and achieve equality with God. It is a direct assault on God as creator. So the article I wrote, my headline is uh, taxpayer funded uterus transplants and other high risk operations. It's over on Harbinger's Daily as well. There is no good, moral, ethical, or medical reason that American citizens should pay for these operations, let alone do them. None, mental health or otherwise. But the AMA says, hey, taxpayers should also help fund this. They are also saying, you know, it would also be good for taxpayers to help fund cosmetic surgeries so men can look or feel more like women. Boy, now we're going to have to start putting the word medical in air quotes when we talk about the medical community. You know, we already do that when it comes to education, <laughs> science, Fauci. All right. <laughs> so this is where we are now. The June issue of the AMA journal, by the way, was called Patient-Centered Transgender Surgical Care. Do they care about patients, about science, about medicine, about objectivity? Remember one of those 
surgeries, year and a half, surgery procedures, follow-ups, $300,000. The love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And we're seeing all sorts of it. New ways of doing evil. So then where are the long-term studies on the effects of injecting hormones into children, for example? I haven't, well, there's one in Sweden, but we'll, it's for another time. They did some, they actually did a 20-year study on, on transgenderism. But anyway, uh, where are the news stories in America about those living in regret and anguish after having had some cosmetic surgery or something pumped into them. And those who wish they never transitioned. They're out there and there are many of them. But they felt so much public pressure because it was popular and everyone's approving of it. Look at Hollywood and look at, you know, the rock stars and the celebrities and look at uh, the public schools. They'll give you a parade when you come out. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us because I think we're going to be seeing more cases like this. And I mean, a lot of them, I mean, the suicide rate, there's a reason for that. Suicide attempt rate and the suicide su success rate, there's a reason. Um, but we're going to find out when these people get older. Some of them are. And it's sad, but they can still come to Jesus if they haven't found him yet, can't they? They need Jesus. That's the hope. That's what they were looking for when they weren't happy with life or with themselves. Jesus was the one they were looking for and they didn't know it because everybody else told them it was something else and just affirmed their delusion. Let's go on. Uh, Walt Heyer, he's got a website called sexchangeregret.com. Uh, I mentioned this yesterday and I remembered it was in today's <laughs> session. After surgery, transgender people are 20 times more likely to die by suicide. Most cases of sex change regret where people have tried speaking out to warn others, they've been suppressed and censored, of course, by the media and our government. Um, but there's a new story I just saw. There's a lot of these coming out, but you gotta look for them, you gotta dig. Decision Magazine. Uh, the media refuses to acknowledge the wave of people detransitioning and coming to Christ. So the tolerant left won't allow these true stories to get out and they won't fund studies that will actually help people that are confused or, um, but Laura Perry Smaltz, she's another person I'm interviewing this coming week on Worldview Matters. She said this in this article, we're starting to see a real wave of people detransitioning. And she is a former transgender, by the way. A site on Reddit called R Detrans has 48,000 members. And she says, you can see their anger on social media. She had the surgery. She lived as Jake for nine years and then came to Christ. And now has got an amazing ministry at First Stone Ministries in Oklahoma. But she says, you can see their anger. They're screaming, why didn't somebody tell me the truth? Why didn't the doctor stop me? Why did they let me cut my breasts off? These people have been extremely traumatized and they can't get any answers. This is from a former transgender who knows and lived the pain and is seeing that in the community and people now coming out and going, what the heck? Why did you let me do this? So the debate will continue. The public is currently a little hesitant, thank God, to jump on board with the so-called progress. Uh, but we're now, this is the third part of this story, we're entering an even darker dimension of delusion. Some will find ways to profit off of this, and you know we've already seen cases of that, but one is Dr. Curtis Crane, for example. For him, business is booming in Austin, Texas, and San Francisco, California. He employs five doctors and does more than 1,000 procedures a year. And, oh, what kind of surgeries? They call them non-binary genital surgeries. He's been doing these since 2015. And demand is increasing. Here's what this is. He specializes in what's called vaginoplasty, which involves castration and then creating an artificial vagina. Uh, for uh, That's actually for a male-to-female patient, the male um, is castration and then they create the female parts. And then he also performs phalloplasty which involves creating and installing an artificial male organ for a single individual. But here's what they're doing now. He's doing this, both of these surgeries on individual people who want to be both. 
And I said in the article, I have an idea. Let's make, science, let, let's make Frankenstein science fiction again. But this is sad. And why? I think, man, 2 Peter 3. They're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. One of the reasons he said, well, some people, you know, they, they're confused. They are almost convinced they are the other, you know, sex. And they want to keep their organs. So let's just put on the other one. The other opposite sex. And they're doing this. Demand is increasing. I told you, he's, he boasts that he's got a waiting list, one to two year waiting list. So nullification procedures, this is where they completely remove everything and just that nullification, it means nothing. It means you have nothing, nothing in your stomach area to the groin, it's nothing. But in these cases, they might allow you to keep something and put the other part, part on. It's really, it is demonic. It is playing God, and judgment is coming. Crane has designed and performed hundreds of these surgeries, and um, according to an article at City Journal, by the way, I mentioned this last year, Christopher Rufo is a good one to follow on this. Christopher Rufo, he writes for City Journal. You can also follow him on X Twitter. The doctor, Dr. Crane, boasts of a long waiting list and claims to have one of the highest volumes of transgender surgeries in the U.S. But here's a little glimmer of hope. The debate about transgender me gender medicine is shifting. He said legislators in 20 states so far has, have recently passed bills to restrict transgender medical interventions such as puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and genital surgeries for minors. And the tide of public opinion seems to be moving against, quote, gender-affirming care, a euphemism for child sex change procedures not supported by evidence and that often cause devastating consequences. Preventing such procedures for patients under 18 has to be the baseline. So Rufo says, oh, come on, at least we can, you know, pass laws and do this and, and protect children and minors. So how does Dr. Crane, how do they, him and others, how do they justify these experimental demonic life-altering surgeries? He appeals to equity, equality, acceptance, and of course, affirmation. What modern medicine is doing is rejecting the laws of nature and nature's God. I read that somewhere in our founding documents. So the utopian solution, he said this, Crane and others on the left to them, their solution is to re-educate society, right? To believe biological sex is not binary. And I'll tell you, they're doing a pretty decent job of marketing evil, aren't they? Re-educating, propaganda, now PR. <laughs> so, but this is what he says. So, so this is, we need to do this because transgender individuals need to become the people they were always meant to be. Wow, my Bible tells me God created every human being in his image exactly the way they were supposed to be. If this concerns you, God bless you because your soul is tormented by evil. And if you feel oppressed by the wickedness, what you see going on in the world today, you're in good company. Righteous Lot felt this. And the judgment that came down on Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities and plains is an example of God's judgment on wickedness but also it's a reminder for us um, a friend of mine says when you see these things happening so much is happening it's hard to keep up with and we were not meant to keep up with this we were not meant to know everything and have the 24 or 7 news cycle and have things in our ears and in our phone we were not meant to be attached to all this stuff we weren't so don't try because you can drive you crazy, you know, just trying. It happened gradually and then suddenly. Isn't that a good description? It happened gradually and then suddenly. Especially if you go back in, in America like 100 years and then see what's happening now. But it's just disappointing, right? We're not surprised, but it's okay to be just disappointed. Why? Because we're in a nation that once held Jesus and the Bible in high esteem. And those were our values, Judeo-Christian values principles and values. That's why it's so disturbing for us to see the fall of America and of our culture. 
and of our church? Where's the church? Let's get back to that for a moment. We can talk about apostasy and the lateness of the hour all day, but what can we do? A lot of churches won't touch this. I mean, definitely not on a Sunday morning, but not even on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. They won't touch this. Okay, so how do you talk about these issues? Well, you have to come to a conference, I guess, or find information you can trust online. But how are true believers to engage? How, how can we respond? We need to be asking those questions. Because we need to have answers like, who was it? Was it Jeff that said we need to be ready when that question comes to give an answer for the hope that we have? Because they're looking for that. They just don't know what form it's coming in. They just know they need hope. They don't have it. They're empty. So we need to be out there, friends, and not hiding our light under a basket or a table. John Stott once said, we should not ask, what's wrong with this world? He said, what we should be asking, he said, for that diagnosis has already been given. Rather, we should ask, what has happened to the salt and light? If you're looking at America, it comes back to the church, the church in America. A few reasons churches avoid confronting evil, the fear of man, ignorance of Bible prophecy, apathy like the lukewarm church of Laodicea, or a lack of belief in the soon coming judgment of God. They think they've got time. It's one of the devil's biggest lies. You've got plenty of time to come to Christ, to get saved, to dot, dot, dot. Paul wrote to the Corinthians reminding them of God's judgment that it was coming again. Interesting, I'll wrap up with a few verses here. 1 Corinthians 10 verses 11 and 12 say, Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. In another shout out to the Old Testament, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome in Romans 15, 4. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Why? So that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. I am right on time. <laughs> perseverance, and that's a first. <laughs> I'm right on time. Um, but it's, it's dark out there, it's getting darker. But perseverance is an important principle for Christians and endurance. And he who endures to the end will be saved. It's, we've, we've got to deal with it. What, we're, what's going on, friends? We are here for such a time as this. I don't remember what speaker said that yesterday. But uh, we are here for now. Um, they hate us because they hate God. They hate Jesus. And to be reminded of any light or any sin, they don't like that. Um, so they lash out. But these are people for whom Christ died. Our goal is not necessarily to win arguments, although we can get into some good debates, nothing wrong with that, but to win them to Christ with truth and love. The problem is we can't be effective if we back out of culture. And um, I think Jeff mentioned Osteen. Oh my goodness, you rattle off this best-selling author, New York Times, popular with the world, his list of books, just the titles. I think he had one, uh, Every Day's a Friday, and it's all about fun, living now, having a good life, blessed, prosperous. I visualize prosperity. Yeah, is that, how biblical is that? He's making a lot of money, isn't he? And the problem with a lot of motivational speakers and people like that is and people in the church tend to think yeah yeah Jesus that's a good thing I should be uh, healthy wealthy and wise or whatever and then they have a cruise ship mentality rather than a battleship mentality do you see that in the American church the cruise ship yeah a lot of believers don't ever want to come into port right so I want to end with a quote from uh, author Eric Metaxas. I've been reading a book, um, Letter to the American Church. And I think about the letter that Jesus spoke through John to the, le <laughs> to the churches in Asia Minor in Revelation 2 and 3. But here's what he's talking today. And Metaxas said this, How have we come to this bizarre pass? If there are injustices done to our fellow Americans, are we not to protest? And if necessary, even fight politically? For what is right, 
just as Bonhoeffer and Wilberforce did? When is speaking about injustice merely political? In the American church today, many pastors believe that we should continue as we have been doing for decades, preach the gospel, teach the Bible, and act as though the current state of our culture and nation is essentially as it has always been. But most people in the pews whom these pastors purport to lead know things are not as they were even a few years ago. They're looking to their leaders to acknowledge this, to help them understand what's happening, and to lead them in standing against it. After all, isn't this precisely why they've been studying the Bible and listening to sermons over the years? Was, it, was not all of that preparation for this hour? That sounds like one of those pastors in the black-robed regiment, you know, back in the late 1700s, man. I mean, they had the black robes on. They preached a you know, fiery sermon from the word of God. Then they took their robe off and grabbed their gun and went out and fought. And because of them and their recruiting people from their churches, we have our freedom because of the men of God. Do you, do you realize that our history is rich with men of God leading people to not only fight biblically, but getting out there and saying, all right, I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have the newspapers. They didn't have television. They didn't have Starbucks. They had, they had churches, and most communities went to churches, and their pastors were their leaders. Anyway, I'm getting off on a whole new thing. But so, fine, just to wrap up, our souls, it's okay to be tormented by evil today, but since lawlessness has increased, we have to guard against our own hearts being hardened and our love growing cold. Christians, we have to guard against that. Don't let your heart become hard to what's going on. And love. Love when, it's, when you don't think it's <laughs> possible to do. Keep loving. I say that to myself. It's hard sometimes to look at some of these perpetrators of evil and the wickedness. And there, because there are deceived, and there are many, especially the younger generation, but there are those who are deceivers. And I have a little less patience with them, but they still need Christ. So draw strength and perspective from the pages of Scripture. Live counterculture. Stay on offense. Serve the Lord in faith. And please encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ because we all need it. And as I like to sign off, God bless you. And as always, keep speaking the truth about things that matter. Lord God, thank you. Thank you so much for giving us this call and this privilege and opportunity to reach this generation with your truth as unpopular as it may be, God, help us to be proclaimers of your gospel. Help us to be messengers of reconciliation. Use us, God. May we be found faithful, and may you be glorified. We thank you for this conference. Continue to move here and be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.